Revelation chapter 11. And we're going to be looking at the second half. From verse 15 onwards. If you are joining us for the first time, then it is actually probably, if you're going to choose to join us at any point in the book of Revelation, you actually are choosing to join us at the best point in Revelation. If you had to pick and choose as to what point you would join us, if you weren't going to join us from the beginning, then this is probably the best point. The reason being is the chapters we're in right now are basically the turning point between the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. To quickly explain what I mean, the majority of the book of Revelation, the majority, not all of it, focuses on a period of time in the future known as the seven years of tribulation. It's a time when Jesus Christ told us there will never be a time like it and never has there been a time before as well. It's a significant time in human history where the full judgment of God is poured out upon the world and Satan, through his man known as the Antichrist, holds full, unrestrained control over the world as well. So it's a seven-year period. But where we are at right now in chapter 11 is at the turning point of that seven years, from the first three and a half years into the second half. And the second half, called by Jesus Christ himself, is called the Great Tribulation. So tribulation is seven, the Great Tribulation is referring to the last three and a half years. A a more commonly used title in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is actually Jacob's Trouble the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob referring to Israel. So another way to put it, Jacob was called Israel in the Old Testament. It could also be put the time of Israel's trouble, the last three and a half years. Chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, and chapter 13 are all linked inseparably so. To understand 11, 12, 10, 11, 12, and 13, you must understand them collectively as well as apart from each other as well. Chapter 10, we saw something very strange happen. An angel from heaven stood on the land and stood on the sea and said, the mystery of God is about to be revealed to the world. The mystery of God is about to be revealed. And we talked about that mystery being We know how the Gentiles are saved, but what is going to happen to Israel? How is God going to keep his covenantal promises over this nation when it all seems lost and done with? Chapter 11 was the story of these two witnesses. And it tells us that they had been prophesying for 1,260 days. And I shared with you an interpretation that I do believe those two witnesses were sharing and prophesying in Jerusalem in the first three and a half years. And when it came for them to be killed, it was literally one of the significant moments that happened halfway through. That after he destroys them and kills them, although they raise up from death three days later, three and a half days later, that is at the same direct moment that the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple and we see the great tribulation begin. Chapter 12, we're not there yet, but chapter 12 is the perspective of Satan. We have a chapter which gives us the perspective of the enemy and how he feels during this time and his motivation during this time. We'll be there next week. And then chapter 13, we see the rise of the first beast and the rise of the second. The reason all of these chapters are linked is they all describe a turning point during this seven years. A moment when Jacob's trouble is about to start. From chapter 13 onwards, we have the in-depth detail about what takes place during this three and a half years. But what we have in these four chapters is the Bible shouting out to us, something different is happening. Something new has started. But today, before we pray, we're going to have a look at a very strange, what seems to be, praise break in Revelation. Very strange moment. You have the two witnesses. 
You have Satan's perspective of what he wants to accomplish in his mission. You have the beast rising out. And then in chapter 11, at the end, in the middle of all of this, you have this praise break. This moment to stop and to praise and celebrate the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's confused a great deal of people, but I believe, as we'll see, it has a great blessing attached to it. So without, with that being said, let us now pray before we enter into the word. Father, with such things as the book of Revelation, we must lean upon you. We must appeal to you and ask you, Heavenly Father, to please help us understand these things, to reveal your scriptures to us by the power of the Holy Spirit, to make known to us what these words mean, Lord. You titled this book, Heavenly Father, The Unveiling of Jesus Christ. It isn't something that you design to be hidden, Lord, but something you design to be unveiled, and you have indeed unveiled it through John to us. And so, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that a further unveiling would happen today, that the rest of this chapter, Lord, would be revealed to us, and not just so that we may gain knowledge, but that we too may join in the chorus of celebration of the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might be encouraged in the victory that we cling to, in the hope that we have. Lord, I pray for those of them, Lord, here who, who do not know you, who have, who lives are not yet hidden in Christ, I pray, Heavenly Father, today would be the day of their salvation, that your spirit would open up their hearts and their minds, irregardless of how many times they've been in church or how many times they've heard sermons. I pray, Lord, today would be the day that you pierce them, Lord, with your truth and just how much you love them. In your precious name, amen. Let's start in verse 15 of Revelation chapter 11. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So previously, what we'd just seen happen in the Bible, what we'd just seen happen was the two witnesses were killed, and for three and a half days, their bodies lay in Jerusalem, and then three and a half days later, they were raised back to life and taken to heaven when Jesus said, come up here. That's the last thing we saw. But at the very final part of what we looked at last week, a warning is given. And the warning at the very final part of what we looked at last week says this, Two woes have passed, one woe is still to come. You can have a look in your Bibles, it says it right there in the line before I've just read. Two woes have passed, one woe has still to come. So we can automatically identify it's not over yet. There's more going to happen, there's more woes, more judgment to still fall upon the earth. And yet, this break is given in between. It says the seventh angel blew his trumpet. Every time a seventh of something is happening in Scripture, there seems to be this moment of clarity, this moment of pausing. In chapter eight, when sorry, in, cha yeah, in chapter eight, when the seventh seal was opened, it says there was half an hour of silence in heaven. No one said a word. Half an hour of silence. Here, when the seventh trumpet is blown, we see this praise erupt in heaven. And later on, when the seventh bowl is poured out, a voice from heaven says, it is done. The wrath of God is complete. So there's always an extra when the seventh happens. Now, I tried using this example when I was kind of practicing for today, and I actually confused myself. So I'm going to hopefully not confuse you guys as I do this. But you know those China dolls you used to be able to buy? I don't know what they're called. But you know the ones which you used to be able to open, and there was a smaller China doll inside? And then you'd open that one, and there was a smaller one, and you could just carry on? I found them just fascinating as a kid. I just wanted them to infinitely carry on and just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Revelation's a bit like that. In the sixth chapter, we saw, fifth chapter, we saw a seven-sealed scroll. Nothing in Revelation happens outside of that seven-sealed scroll. Everything that happens in the seven years is involved in the seven-sealed scroll. But when you open up the seventh-sealed scroll, there's seven trumpets. And when you open up the seven trumpets, 
there's seven bowls. And so the seven bowls are within the seven trumpets, and the seven trumpets are within the seven, seven sealed scroll. All of it is contained within that title deed we saw in chapter five. Now, I said that to myself yesterday, and I confused the life out of myself, so I really apologize if you're wondering what on earth I'm talking about. The point is there's layers to Revelation. And as we're making our way through, we're breaking down layers here just to help you understand what's going on. So the seventh angel blew his trumpet. The last trumpet now brings about the seven bowls. The last trumpet now brings about the seven bowls that we previously saw is considered as the last woe. Two woes have come, one woe is left, and the one woe is the collection of the seven bowls. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, this verse has caused a great deal of confusion over the years, because chronologically, that hasn't happened yet. A lot of commentators have struggled. Some have even been as brave to say that this was misplaced by scholars. That it should have been in Revelation 20 or 19. It's not meant to be here. It was accidentally placed. I don't believe that. I believe in the sovereignty of God and it's where it's meant to be. However, it confuses a great deal of people because in the story of Revelation, this hasn't happened yet. They are talking in a present tense about something that is still, at this present time, yet future. So we're going to get into it a little bit. The first thing I'd like to say is, in a way, it has happened. In a way, it has happened. In a way, it's true right now, in a way. Let me explain why. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected... He not only made a way for humanity, fallen and sinful as we were, to be redeemed to our God, but he also, as we talked about in Revelation chapter 5, purchased back creation. In Genesis chapter 2, God said to Adam and Eve, I give you the earth. You have dominion over it. You have dominion over the land, over the sea, over everything that's in them. You have dominion over the earth. I give you this title deed. You have ownership. Look after it, care for it, be good stewards of it. When they then rebelled against God, Satan took that title deed. He took it. He became the God of this world lowercase g, the ruler of this world. But when Jesus died on the cross, the reason in Revelation chapter 5, John says no one could even open the scroll. No one could take the scroll. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Only one, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, because he had paid the price for it. The only price that could be paid had to be paid by him. So he takes back his creation. He takes back the title deed. And we, I don't want to go too much into this, but we talked about what it was to have to be related to the person who had lost the property, what it was to have to be related to the person who had previously owned the property, and how all of that comes into why God had to come as a man. Because he could not redeem it as God. He had to redeem it as man because it was originally given to man. So there's a massive picture here that spreads across the scripture when we begin to understand Revelation chapter 5. However, there is a story in Jeremiah that helps explain what's happening at this present time. Because while Jesus on the cross purchased back that title deed and placed it in the hands of the Father, one day to be opened, as we're now reading about in Revelation, unfortunately, at this present time, that title deed remains closed. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was told by God, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon is about to come and take Israel. He's about to come and take over the land. And Jeremiah, I want you to do something really strange. So strange, in fact, that Jeremiah actually asks God and says, really? God says to Jeremiah, go buy a plot of land. Jeremiah thinks, Lord, you've just told me that Babylon are going to come and wipe this land out. No, no, Jeremiah buy a plot of land. 
And once the Babylonian era is over, that land will be returned to you. So Jeremiah went, he brought the land, he was given a title deed, sealed, just like the one in Revelation 5, written on the front, written on the back. And once the Babylonian time of captivity had come to an end, Jeremiah's descendants received that land back. However, notice that while in God's eyes the land belonged to Jeremiah, it was still very much under Babylonian control. In the same way, that this land belongs to the king known as the Lord Jesus Christ. But it is still very much under a, another ruler's control. Still under a, another kingdom presently. Now this has been twisted slightly. What I'm saying to you, these verses that we're reading in Revelation have been twisted slightly with something called a post-millennial view. And I, I don't want to go too much into the big words of it. I'm not big on big words, but I'm just going to very quickly explain what they believe. Quite simply, they believe that right now we are living in the thousand-year reign. They believe that at the cross, Satan was actually bound and cast into prison. That at the cross, the kingdom of the earth became the kingdom of the Lord. And that ever since the cross, we have been expanding that kingdom. They believe that once that kingdom has spread across the entire globe, Christ will then come back. So until you have converted the world to Christianity, Christ will not return. That's the post-millennial view. Big problem with that. We're losing. Really big problem. We are losing miserably if that's the case. If the target is to convert the world to Christianity and only then Jesus Christ will come back, all of my motivation to evangelize has just disappeared. Because I don't know about you, it doesn't take much of a discerning person to look at the world and realize that if anything the church is declining, not increasing. And when I say church, by the way, I'm talking about true church. I'm talking about God-fearing, Bible-believing, spirit-filled believers who will not compromise irregardless of the time, the culture, or the pressure placed upon them. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about mega churches with pastors flying over in million-pound jets, although I will be getting in my helicopter a bit later to go home, but <laughs> thank you for purchasing it for me. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking for those of you who are new. <laughs> There are three big points to this. The first one is the church is not winning. If that's the case, then we're losing. The second one is Paul in the New Testament tells us that Satan is still the lowercase g God of this world. And he tells us that Satan is still the ruler of this current darkness. So the belief that he's been bound and chained away cannot be lined up with scripture. Third, you have to symbolize and allegorize most of Ezekiel, especially the last parts, Zechariah, and pretty much all of Revelation. Or you have to place Revelation not as prophecy, but something that's already happened. And probably my biggest problem with it is Israel disappears from the picture. If the church has to simply spread Christendom across the entire world, Israel no longer has a destiny. And the covenant of God over Israel is now annulled. Unfortunately, this belief is stooped and comes from a foundation of Roman Catholicism. The Roman Catholics believed it was their duty, through force or through conversion, to spread Catholicism across the entire globe, and they did so by force, with massive armies. This belief, this post-millennial belief, has its roots in the Catholic understanding of casting a wide net across the world and converting a population of people, whether through kings or through armies in left, right, and center. It simply softened over the years with a more liberal view. So this is not what I'm referring to when I tell you that Christ has indeed purchased back the land. It is not a post-millennial view. It's simply a fact that what Christ accomplished on the cross was not only your salvation, but also purchasing back the title deed. That he has yet to open. One day he will, and that's what we're learning about in Revelation. So let's carry on. Let's go back to this confusing verse. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign 
forever and ever. This is, at this present time, still future. It still needs to happen. But the voices are not on earth. Please, please keep that in mind. Read the verse. The voices are not on earth. The voices are in where? Heaven. If this had happened, the voices would be saying this on the earth. No, they are looking forward to what is going to happen. They are saying this from a heavenly perspective. Another evidence that this is happening, yet future, is at the end of chapter 11, we see the temple of God open and the Ark of Covenant within it. Where's the temple? In heaven. Revelation tells us the temple will come down from heaven when God sets up his kingdom. But at the end of this chapter, it's still in heaven. So while they are talking in present tense, chronologically, this has yet to happen. It's prophetic in nature. Plus, also, we have to remember, these guys are not restrained by time the same way we are. And so their perspective of things is very different from ours all the time that we're under the constraints of time. And that's a very difficult thing to begin to get our heads around. The kingdom of the world. Some of your translations, if you've got a KJV, may say the kingdoms of the world. I don't particularly mind that translation. I do prefer the kingdom, singular, because as the Bible teaches, there are only two kingdoms in this world. There's only two. Scrap all the flags, all the countries, all the borders, all the nations. The Bible teaches there are two kingdoms in this world. One the kingdom of God, and two, the kingdom of the world, or otherwise known in scripture, the kingdom of Satan. What is the kingdom of the world is a good question to answer. The kingdom of this world has a king. His name is what we call the enemy, Satan, the devil. The kingdom of this world has followers in the unseen and seen. People subconsciously following, even though they don't know it, and people who outwardly follow, knowing exactly what they do. The kingdom of the world is built on a foundation of lies. It's built on idolatry. It's built on self-independence from God. And it's built on rebellion. The kingdom of the world started when Satan led Adam and Eve astray through lying to them that they would be better off without God and they would be better off becoming as much like him as possible. Basically, the kingdom of the world is founded on, literally founded on, you live your best life. You live for you. You become wiser. You become better. Become a better version of yourself. That's all that matters, is your success, your prosperity, your happiness. That's what the kingdom of the world is literally built on. But it's a lie. It's a lie of the devil. Because when a creation has been created to have a relationship with their creator, to tell them that they will be better off outside of that relationship is a lie. It's a lie that Adam and Eve have believed. And it's a lie that at one point in our lives, all of us believed. That we are better off without him that we don't need him. It's a lie. Satan's intention was not to free you from the bondage that God placed you under, this lovely, beautiful garden and paradise and earth he'd made for you, this bondage that he placed you under. It was not to free you so that you can live your independent life. Satan, being the liar he is, wanted one thing and one thing only, and that is to be worshipped. The only reason he separated you from God is so that he could have you for himself. And that is revealed to us in scripture, Satan wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped. So once again, we can add to the foundation of the world, selfishness, pride, idolatry. What about the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is founded on Jesus Christ. Not lies, not idolatry, it's founded on the cornerstone, on the rock. The Lord Jesus Christ. God's kingdom, and I love this, is founded on love. 
God's kingdom is founded, literally founded on love. A love that took the Lord to the cross to take that very sin and rebellion onto himself. One is founded in lies and pride. The other is founded on a sacrificial love to restore you to himself by literally giving his life to do so. God's kingdom is founded on grace, a favor we do not deserve, but he gives to us anyway. God's kingdom is founded on sacrifice, but here's the crazy thing, not yours. His. God's kingdom is founded on his sacrifice. God's kingdom is founded not on self-independence, not on self at all. God's kingdom is founded on complete and absolute dependence on him. On complete and absolute dependence on him. Satan's kingdom is all about destroying those within it. God's kingdom is about saving those within it. Satan's kingdom says you can do whatever your flesh wants. Enjoy yourself to the max. God's kingdom tells you the truth that it will ultimately destroy you. The pleasure is a lie in itself. It will ultimately destroy you. Enjoy true meaning, true good and satisfaction that can only be found in him. In God's kingdom, sin will be no more. But in the enemy's kingdom, sin is in abundance. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now that sounds very judgmental, but look what he says next. And such were some of you. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He says, we were like this. We did this, but Jesus Christ saved us, washed us clean, sanctified us for his kingdom. The kingdom of the world. So this is a, now that I'm, the reason I'm giving this background, the reason I'm going this much into it, I want you to understand the absolute magnificence of what's being described here. Listen again, now that I've gone through the kingdom of the world, look what it says. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. Everything I've just described to you about the kingdom of the world has now become the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the attributes of his kingdom now overshadow and remove the attributes of Satan's. Later on in Revelation, during the actual thousand-year reign, Satan is cast into a pit that he can no longer deceive the nations. That's what it says. He's cast into a pit that he can no longer deceive the nations. And for a thousand years, all this world will know is the righteous decree of the one true king, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as Christians, we yearn for this. To go outside and to be able to, to, be able to pass a guy on the street and say, don't you just love Jesus? Isn't he just the greatest king? And a random guy in the fish and chip shop be like, man, did you see what King Jesus did the other day in Jerusalem? Did you see what he decreed? I'm going there next month with the family to see him. Are you coming? Praise be to God for that time. A thousand years of it. A thousand years of it. Daniel 2, 44 says, And in those days of the kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. In the book of 2 Samuel, God made a promise to King David. He said, after you, David, one is going to sit upon the Davidic throne, and it will never, ever, ever be taken over again. Someone is going to sit upon the Davidic throne. Now, here's what's really important to understand Revelation. I really want you to understand this. When Jesus ascended, he said something very specific. He said, I go to sit on my 
Father's throne at his right hand side. Listen to what he said in Revelation 3. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit on my throne, listen, as I also conquered and sat down on my father's throne. What Jesus is saying here is I have not yet received the Davidic throne. Jesus right now sits at the right hand side of the father. He has not yet taken his rightful place on earth upon the eternal Davidic throne that God promised David in 2 Samuel. That is very important because it's completely contrary to the belief that Jesus is ruling right now on a Davidic throne. No, that is still to happen. Well, otherwise, why do we pray? Your kingdom come, your will be done. We pray it because we are looking forward to the day when Christ sets up his kingdom on earth. Now, listen, when Christ sets up his kingdom on earth, not when Aaron sets it up for him, who the heck am I to set up his kingdom? When he sets up his kingdom on earth. And it says, he shall reign forever and ever. I don't know about you, but an eternity is an awfully long time. It's actually a contradicting statement (laughs) because there is no time. It's just eternity. And he will reign on earth forever and ever. This is what we have to look forward to. Sometimes it's easy, isn't it? Especially, I don't know about you, sometimes you look in the world, Haley, my wife often says, Aaron, you know, Stay away from the news sometimes because it can just fill your heart and your mind with so much depression and so much sadness. I find myself sometimes getting distracted while doing sermons, clicking and watching news articles and going back to the sermon and being like, what did I just watch for 10 minutes? It just depressed me. But even in our own lives as well, independently, individually, we can go through such difficult seasons. Seasons where it just feels like we're getting pummeled from every direction. And that feeling of hopelessness can creep up. But this is what we're clinging to. This is the hope we have. That regardless of what's happening now, we know who wins. We know who gets the victory. We know who accomplishes exactly what he said he's going to do. A kingdom forever and ever and ever. Let's carry on in verse 16. And the 24 elders who sat on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. These 24 elders, this is the last time we will see them in the book of Revelation. The last time we'll see them collectively, 24 of them together. Every time we've seen them so far, it has always been before God's throne, praising him. What's really interesting is in chapter 20, it tells us that on the earth, thrones are set up. Now, it doesn't tell us who's sitting on them, It just tells us that thrones are set up. So this is the last time we see these elders on thrones in heaven. The next time we see the mention of thrones in the plural is when they are set up for who to rule upon them? The saints. So you can make of that what you will. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. I love the fact that they start with a very important point. We give thanks to you. Every single Christian, when they meet the Lord Jesus Christ, should only be uttering words of praise. We give thanks to you. One of the most dangerous things as Christians takes place in Matthew 7. The Lord says, will not many come to me in the last days? And will they not say, did 
we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What Jesus is saying here is if a person comes up to me when I return and says, Lord, look what I did. Look how I helped. Look how I worked. Look what kingdom progression I did. Look at me, Lord. The Lord literally says to that person, I never knew you. Because anyone who truly knows me, anyone who truly understood the gospel, anyone who truly belonged to me, the first thing they'd be doing is saying, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Not Lord, look what I did. Pointless. So they start by saying, we give thanks to you. I love the verse that says, even the good works that God has given you, God prepared before you. If you do a good work, you're not even able to take credit for that. Because God is the one who prepared it before your very feet to do. So all praise to God. We give thanks to you. Lord God Almighty. The word Lord there is the word theos. It means master. He to whom a person or thing belongs. The owner, the prince, the sovereign one. Sometimes it makes people feel slightly uncomfortable when we describe the word Lord like this. They don't like the fact it's, it's equivalent to owning someone. They're like, I don't like that. I would remind you that in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, I have been purchased by the blood of Christ. He says, my life no longer belongs to me. I am actually, he actually uses these words, he says, I am a slave to Christ. A servant to Christ. I have been purchased by him on the cross. He says, no longer I who live, but Christ who live through me. Now that would seem quite difficult if I left it there, but here's what's beautiful is while God could indeed bring us into the house as servants, he actually brings us into the house as sons and daughters. While Christ did indeed purchase your lives, he purchased them in order that he can be your father, in order that he, you can be his son, in order that you can be his daughter. He purchased them back from one who took them by force. He purchased them back from sin and the enslavement that sin causes it carries on with the word theos in Romans chapter 10. It tells us that a believer must first believe in their heart. And then it tells us that after believing in their heart that Christ raised from the dead after three days, it says they confess with their mouths and then they will be saved. But the confession is very specific. It says they must confess that Jesus is theos, Lord, Master. It's an overflow from what's in here. A true belief in Christ overflows into an acknowledgement that he is now my Lord. And we as Christians are not just to say it. It should be evidenced in your life. It should be evidenced that your life no longer serves yourself, but it serves one who has purchased you by the blood of Christ. It serves the Lord God Almighty. The word almighty is the word pantocrator, and it literally means the one who has everything in his hands. Out of, the, uh, out of the ten times in the New Testament it's used, nine of those times appear in the book of Revelation. Nine out of ten. The one who has everything in his hands, the almighty God, the almighty sovereign one. In Isaiah 9, 6, I once, on a YouTube uh, video we put up, we once had a comment saying, you know, if Jesus is God, you won't be able to find me anywhere in Scripture that he's called mighty like God is called mighty. You won't be able to find me anywhere in Scripture where if Jesus is God, find me where he's called mighty like God is. And I said, challenge accepted. <laughs> Isaiah 9, 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. Who does that sound like? And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. 
mighty God. I did comment that and I never got a reply. <laughs> so I'm guessing you saw it. And then it gives us something else. Who is and who was. Now this I love. What is missing? Oh, I love this verse. In Revelation chapter 1, when Jesus revealed himself to John, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the one who was, who is, and who is to come. That's who I am, John. It hasn't happened yet. I'm the one who is, who was, and who is to come. But what do these voices cry out? The one who is and who was. Uh, why not who is to come? Because he's come. Because he's there. They are talking prophetically about when they see the Lord Jesus Christ take his kingdom. So they're saying, you were, you are, but you're here. So you're not to come. It's happened. So once again, pointing towards a future event. Pointing towards a future event. For you have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. You have taken your great power and begun to reign. The kingdom of God is not, and I'm sorry if this upsets you in our Western culture, it's not a democracy. There is no parliament in the thousand-year kingdom. You do not get to vote. I wouldn't trust myself to, to be honest, up against the perfect Jesus Christ. It is a monarchy. It is a ruling from a king who sits on high. The Lord Jesus Christ as king, and he reigns over the entire world. It says, your nation, the nations raged, but your wrath came. Now, I'd just like you to go to Psalm 2. We're going to spend a tiny bit of time in Psalm 2. In your Bibles, turn there. It's a fairly easy one to find. It's just after Psalm 1, but Psalm chapter 2. I believe that John, through inspired by the Holy Spirit, is linking these two passages for a, a very good reason. Here's what it says in Psalm 2, such an amazing psalm. It says this, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords from us. He who sits in heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Psalm 2 and Revelation 11 are describing a moment in time when the nations are raging and desiring, one, to destroy Israel, and two, to set up this one world kingdom finally without these nuisance in a way of this nation that continually stand against them. And when Christ returns, he will not be received in a way of, thank goodness you're here. At this present time, as described in the book of Zechariah, we haven't got there yet, but Zechariah describes at this present time, the mark of the beast has already been given out. Zechariah describes that at this present time, the nations are already gathered against Jerusalem, all of the nations. Half of Jerusalem is literally destroyed, and the other half's about to be. Zechariah describes that they gather to guess where? The Mount of Olives. Do you think it's a coincidence 
that Satan gathers the armies of the world to the very place that Jesus said, I'm coming back here, it's almost like he's anticipating something. So when Jesus comes back, it's not met with applause. It's not met with celebration. It's met with fear. It's met with a rage. Have you ever been, and this is a really silly analogy to use, but have you ever been told off by your mum and dad? And you're, you're, you've been like, maybe you've been like told off or, or like smacked or put on the step or whatever, right? And afterwards, you're just so angry. You're like, oh, but they're your dad. So you're like, oh, I'm going to just hide how angry I am right now, but I can't actually do anything about it. But if I could, I would, but I'm not going to because I'm terrified. You know that kind of inner fury that a child will have in their bedroom as they're trying to work out what just happened? I liken it to that sort of rage. Because it's a rage that they can do nothing about. It's a rage that they, they literally has no action to it whatsoever. They're just furious that they've lost. But losing is an inevit inevitability. There's nothing they can do. So the nations rage at the fact that they have now been subjugated to the one true king. But the one true king in his wrath says, I will rule from my holy hill. Now, every time the Bible speaks about Christ's second coming and his rule, it's very, very different from the first coming. And here's why. It talks about him ruling with a rod of iron. It talks about him breaking the vessels into pieces. It talks about him placing his hand upon them with firmness and ferocity. This is not the same as him riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. This is a conquering king who has come to take what he's already purchased back from someone it doesn't belong to. And to place them under the authority of God, whether they like it or not. Very, very different from how we read the Gospels, isn't it? The Lamb of God is indeed the Lamb, but he is also the Lion at the same time. And the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding your saint servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, both small and great. If you go through what the elders are saying, what you're actually being given in a prophecy is a timeline. Literally, what you're being given is a timeline. First, the nations rage. Then Christ comes. Then, after the thousand years, as we know in Revelation 20, 21, the dead are judged. So this is referring to right at the very end, before the new heaven and the new earth are made. Very quickly, for those of you who maybe aren't with me on this, Christ returns, rescues Israel. Satan is bound. For a thousand years, he reigns on the earth. After a thousand years, he releases Satan. And Satan goes to every corner of the planet and deceives the nations. He then leads the nations against Jesus in one last attempt to overthrow this king. And it is called the Battle of Armageddon. In that battle, although as a young Christian, I always envisioned myself with a shield and a sword and charging into battle with the Lord... Unfortunately, from my silly imagination, that isn't the case. The Lord literally defeats them with the word of his mouth. He doesn't need Aaron and his sword and his shield. Although it was pretty cool in my imagination. Oh, charge, ah. No, it wasn't like that. The Lord just says, enough. Okay, Lord. He defeats them. Satan is then thrown into the lake of fire to, to be there for all eternity. And then, then, the great white throne judgment takes place. Then the dead are raised, and all people, it says the sea give up their dead, the land give up their dead, and everyone is judged. Based off two things, only two really simple things. One, as to whether your sin was taken on the cross by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, or two, as to whether you have rejected that salvation and the sin now falls on you. Sin will be paid for, one way or another. There's only two ways it's paid. You pay, or Jesus pays. They're the two choices you have. God loves you so much, he desires that his only son, Jesus Christ, pay for you. That's how much he loves you. 
but people knowing this still decide to take that risk upon themselves. And it's not a risk, it's a guarantee. Every sin will be paid for one day, either by Jesus or by you. The time for the dead to be judged. Now look at this separation. Please look at this separation. Look at this. The time for the dead to be judged. And then look what it says. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name. Interesting that, that once the judgment has been taken upon Christ, there is no longer judgment left upon those who are in Christ. So look what it says. The dead will be judged and the rewarding of the saints, prophets, saints, and those who fear your name, a separation of the two, both small and great. I like that, both small and great. I think that's really important. As human beings, we often have this strange idolatry towards magnifying a certain person because of what they do and minimizing someone else because of what they do. God said to Samuel, I do not judge people the way human beings judge people. You judge them based off appearance. I judge them based off their heart. The preacher who is flying around with the million pound jet or my helicopter out back that I'll be departing in a little while, that preacher may earn nothing compared to the lady who stacked chairs for 45 years, but every single time she did it in church, she did it because she loved Jesus. The person who fed the homeless people and never told anyone about it. The person who cared for orphans and widows and never told anyone about it, but did it simply between them and God. The person who went out of their way to try and build up their brothers and sisters in Christ, to try and encourage them, to try and love them, to try and lead them into healing. The person who did everything they can to honour God in their lives and love him and serve him with all of their heart, their soul, their strength and their mind. Not so that people could see them, so that God could see them. That person has a great reward waiting for them in heaven. Not necessarily the preachers, the pastors. Although I hope there might be something, but still, who knows? Only the Lord knows. Matthew 23, the greatest among you shall be your servant. What did it just say? The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever, read that again, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 18, at the time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put the child in the midst of them and he said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What a child like. A child is fully, absolutely fully, unequivocally dependent on their parent. A child needs their parent for everything. A child needs their parent for the most undesirable of things, like going to the toilet, to the most magnificent of things, like going to the park. A child needs their parent for everything. A child wakes up every day excited to see their parent. Doesn't want to go to bed because their parents are still awake. A child loves to hug their parents, spend time with their parents, get praise from their parents. A child doesn't care about me if I'm not their parent. He just wants his parent. If you have a son in a crowd of 100 and the mother cries out to the son, he knows his mother's voice straight away. That's what it is to be a child of God, to be as dependent on God every single day as a three-year-old, as a four-year-old, as a five-year-old is dependent on their parent every single day. The second you get to the point in your spiritual maturity where you start to think, God, I, I've got this. You are in serious, serious trouble. Spiritual maturity should not be growing in self-dependence. Spiritual maturity should be the realization as you grow of how much more you need God. That's the mark of a mature Christian, not someone who can do it all themselves. That's the complete opposite. 
It says both small and great and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. That is the moment when God rids this world of the devil, rids this world of the demons, rids this world of those who have given their allegiance to him and have sworn their allegiance to him. He destroys the destroyers of the earth. Remember that nowhere in the Bible does there describe any sort of mourning for Satan. Someone once said to me, and they really did, they said, and I understand where they're coming from, they'd just given their life to Christ, they said, should we feel sorry for demons? Should we feel sorry for the devil? In the Bible, there is no description in any way, shape, or form of any mourning for these beings. The only mourning described in the Bible for those who are cast into hell is for men and women. God says, do you not think I would rather they turn to me and be saved? Do you think I take any pleasure when the people I love so much die without knowing me? And then verse 9, we're going to finish with this. as a very mysterious verse. Then God's temple in heaven. Where? In heaven. Not yet on earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There were flashes of lightning and rumblings, pearls of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. A strange moment. God's temple, the same temple that later on we see coming out from heaven. Then God's temple was heaven was, in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. For those of you who don't understand the significance of this moment, there it is twofold. One, the ark of the covenant has been missing ever since Babylon took over Jerusalem. No one knows where the Ark of the Covenant is. For those of you who, who don't know, just take it one step further. The Ark of the Covenant was something that God instructed Moses to create. And within the Ark, it was in the Holies of Holies, within the tabernacle or within the temple later on. And within the Ark was the tablets of stone that the Lord wrote the law on. There was Aaron's uh, staff that had budded as proof that he was to be the high priest. There was a pot of manna that was kept to show how God provided for Israel during the wilderness. And they carried all of these kind of sacraments in the Ark of the Covenant and carried it along their way as a sign of God's covenant over this nation. But once Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, marched into Jerusalem, marched into the temple, it tells us that he took the pots, he took the pans, he took the gold, he took the silver, he took the furnishings. But it never says anywhere what happened to the Ark of the Covenant. Many theories, some people think it's in Ethiopia, some people think it's buried under the Temple Mount. There are all sorts of theories. I have a theory. I think it's right here. I think it's right here. I may have just sussed it, everyone. Someone called Israel, I found it. I think it's right here. The Ark of His Covenant was seen within His Temple. Now, there's one slight change, and this is beautiful. In the Old Testament, the description used was always the Ark of the Covenant. Always. In the Old Testament, it's always the Ark of the Covenant. But here we see something different. The Ark of His Covenant. The Covenant He made. In Genesis chapter 15, when God began to make a covenant with Abraham... He told Abraham to get these animals and to cut them in two and lay them aside. And for those of us in the Western world, we have no idea what's going on. Very simply, Abraham somehow knew exactly what to do with them. And the reason being is that what was happening there was an ancient way of signing a contract. It was an ancient way of signing a covenant. And what would happen is the man with, with another man would stand in the middle of the animals which have been split in two. And what they would say to each other is, if you break the covenant or if I break the covenant, let this happen to us. So if either one of us break the covenant, let us be split in two like these animals. That's what the covenant signing was. That's how serious it was. Something beautiful happens. Abraham does it and he spends all day keeping the birds away from these animals. And he gets to night, and God still hasn't turned up, and he falls into a sleep. When Abraham wakes up, he sees God standing in the middle. He sees God standing in the middle. But Abraham's outside. 
So for a covenant, surely Abraham needs to quickly get in there. But God says, no, wait there. Because this covenant is not based on you. You play no part in this. This covenant is only and will only ever be based on me. Abraham, I don't trust your name. I trust mine. Abraham, I know you're a good man, but I don't really trust your promises. Abraham, I can't really trust you to keep up your end of this covenant. But Abraham, you can always trust me to keep my promises and never change my mind. Now that's for Israel. Let's flip it over. Did you die on the cross? Did you have any part in it whatsoever? Did you sit in heaven with the Lord and draw the blueprint? Did you carry the cross up the hill with the Lord? Was that you? Did you even know about it before you were born? When Jesus Christ died on the cross, here's what he said. The same thing he said to Abraham, he says to you, this is not based on you. This is not based on your goodness. This is not based on your promise, on your ability to remain faithful to me. This, like then, is only based on me. My obedience, my works, my faithfulness, my unchanging mind and heart, my ability to keep a promise over your life. Praise God for that. Because if I spent, if I was included to 0.1% of that covenant, and if 0.1% of that covenant relied on my ability to keep it, I'd be marching in the other direction to hell with everyone else. Because that's my flesh. That's my nature. But when my salvation is no longer based on the promise I can keep, but based on the promise God can keep, then like the Apostle Paul John says in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, I can have confidence for the day of judgment. Because my confidence is not in me. It's in the promise keeper, in the Lord. This is his covenant. His covenant. And the second very quick meaning and the reason it's so important is the Jewishness of it. God is giving a message here to Israel. The Ark of the Covenant means nothing to the Gentile. It means nothing. What does the Ark of the Covenant mean to the Gentile? It wasn't given to the Gentiles. It didn't hold things that the Gentiles had anything to do with. It was all about Israel. God, when the temple opens, is reminding Israel at the turn of the Great Tribulation, you are still my people. My covenants are eternal. My promises have not gone anywhere. I'm coming back for you. This is why this interlude happens before we find out all these terrible things that take place. Because before we get there, God wants to remind the nation of Israel, remember, I, mine is the victory. They do not win. I come back for you. Why? Because it's my covenant to keep based on my name, my faithfulness. Praise God for that. Then there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and earthquake and heavy hail. Just simply a cataclysmic overflow of what is being shown on earth, poured out on heaven. So to finish, I want to appeal to those of you who may be here for the first time. Maybe you've been to church a hundred times. Maybe this is the thousandth sermon you've heard. Maybe your wife or your husband, your son or your daughter, your mother or your father continually go on about God to you. I want you to understand the reason is, is because there is nothing more important in all existence in the whole cosmos that you know the one who created you. It is the single most important aspect of your entire cre existence as a whole. That you know that God loves you. That you know that his love for you led him to send his only son to die on the cross for you, to take your sins, to resurrect after three days, to create a born-again people by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he says something amazing. When you say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Jesus just simply says, believe in me and you will be saved. Trust in what he said he has done. Believe in Jesus Christ. Confess him as your Lord and Savior. And you will be saved and receive the promised Holy Spirit, which will create in you 
a new heart, a new mind, a new person altogether. No longer belonging to the kingdom of this world, which is heading in one direction and one direction only, but belonging to the kingdom of God that lasts forever and ever and ever. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we have the victory. It is not because we have attained it. It is not because we purchased it. It is because you have given it to us through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the victorious one. We have the victory through you, our Lord. And we look to that day when you make all things new. I thank you that in your wisdom, before you made creation new, you made us anew. And then once you are finished making us anew, you make creation anew. We look forward to the day, Father, when you reign from your throne in Jerusalem. We look forward to the day when we can see you face to face. We look forward to the day when we can make visits to you and be with you in your presence. We look forward to the day when this fallen, sinful world is removed and a new one is placed. Father, I pray for the souls of those whose sins are still upon themselves. I pray, Heavenly Father, they would reach out and take the hand of Jesus Christ and their sins would be taken by you upon the cross, Lord, as you desire them to do so, that they too might be saved and have this hope and victory that we have. Father, we thank you for our salvation. Thank you for your covenant that it's based on you and not on us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in this place. We praise your mighty name. Amen.